Okay, welcome to class. Happy Friday. Weekend is here. Just 50 minutes of material science between you and the weekend. Okay, we'll uh, start with the reading quiz. So get logged in, and the first question is, families of equivalent planes are denoted with which symbols? Round brackets, curly brackets, pointed brackets, or square brackets? Okay, another 30 seconds or so. Okay, we're going to wrap this one up. Families of equivalent planes are denoted, denoted with which symbol? Yeah, it is the curly brackets. Okay, how about this one? Large interplanar spacings, so if DHKL is a large number, we observe this. Um, <laughs> I did a typo here. All right, well, everyone's going to get this one right. I was supposed to say uh, are observed at small values of 2 theta. So ignore the at large. Ignore that part. Large interplanar spacings are observed at small values of 2 theta, true or false. I'll have to give everyone credit for this, but which one is it? If your interplanar spacing is large, where do you observe the 2 theta value? Okay, answers in. Okay, wrapping this pull up, do we see them at small values? Is that true or false? Again, I'm going to make this one worth a point either way. Then the last one is network formers in glass, like sodium oxide or calcium oxide. By the way, that's soda, like if you've heard of soda lime glass, soda is Na2O, lime is CaO, so they add these things to silica because they are network formers. Network formers like Na2O or CaO create disorder, true or false. Okay, wrapping this one up. Is it true or false? Do they create disorder, people think? <laughs> people think false. It's actually true. It's actually true. So I may go back for today's reading quiz and give you points for all these, but 
I would like you to do the reading, but these are really simple questions if you've done the reading. So today I will correct them, but that's not always generally going to be true. I should, you should know these if you've been doing the reading. Okay, we left off last time talking about carbon. And the first term that I want to introduce, yeah, th uh, Thomas? Uh, We'll talk about it later today. They create disorder. Okay, the first structure we're going to talk about um, of carbon. First off, I guess the first thing to note is that carbon exists in multiple structures. We've been talking about it all semester. We said there's diamond and there's graphite. We're going to show you a couple more. Diamond cubic, we said this structure looks a whole lot like something that we already saw. It looks just like zinc blend if zinc blend was all the same type of atom. Zinc blend, remember that's the one that was zinc sulfide, and so you had zinc atoms on the corners and the faces, and then you had sulfur atoms here. Well, if they're all the same type of atom, then we call it the diamond cubic structure, right? And again, we said this is a relatively open structure because carbon can only be bonded to four other carbons, and that creates a pretty big open structure. We already talked about how it's an FCC lattice. So how is graphite different? Graphite, instead of being a three-dimensional covalently bonded structure, graphite is a two-dimensional covalently bonded structure with weak bonding between those layers. So graphite, you've probably seen this if you've been paying attention at all in the last few years, graphite and graphene have become a big deal, and those are just sheets of carbon. So carbon, I just said that carbon has to be bonded to four other carbons, but if you do the math here, you start adding these things up, say this one in the middle, if you add how many carbon it's bonded to, it's not four. So how do we get around this? What, what must be happening? You have some double bonds. Yeah, you have this delocalized electron. Sometimes they'll draw it like this. They'll say like double bond, double bond, double bond. And so if you have these double bonds in there, then that would make up the four bonds that you need. Now every carbon has four bonds when you count the double bond. But it's actually more complex than that because you could choose to have your double bonds there or you could choose to have your double bonds here, here, and here. And in fact, that extra electron is sort of, it's what's called a resonant structure. The electron can choose which one of those sites it's on, right? But still, you've got carbon bonded to four, and so in the plane, graphite is actually really strong in the plane uh, of this thing, because it's covalent bonds. Or graphene, if you've heard people talking about graphene, which is just a single sheet of graphite, they talk about the ridiculous you know, mechanical properties of that stuff. It's very, very, very strong um, for, uh, in the plane. But between the planes, between these layers, it's only held together by van der Waals forces, right? So you've got these planes of, of graphite, and there's no covalent or ionic bonding between those layers. It's just van der Waals bonding, right? So, which is a very weak bonding force, which is why your pencil, right, which is made of graphite, you can write on paper really easily because when you start to push that against paper, these sheets of graphite just slide right off of one another and are left over on the paper behind it, right? Which is why graphite makes a great lubricant, right? If you spray on dry lubricant, something like graphite lubricant, uh, these sheets can slide past one another really, really easily and actually can lubricate a component, right? So that's graphite, but there's other ways that you can put carbon together, right? There's something called buckyballs, which is, to the best of my knowledge, they don't really serve any purpose. That, I might be wrong. They may have some purpose, but somebody discovered that you can actually put carbon together in these unique, large, what we call a macromolecule, right? So if you look at this, in the buckyball itself, there's 60, I think, carbon atoms? Yeah, 60 carbon atoms, and if you look at the faces, there's a bunch of hexagons and pentagons. So there's just a way you can arrange that. And then somebody realized you can actually take these buckyballs themselves and those can form big old what are called super lattices, right? That's an FCC arrangement, but you're not talking about atoms here. These are buckyballs, right? So again, I don't know what technological purpose these things serve because uh, it's not my area of research. I, I assume there's something. I have no idea what it is. And then there's carbon nanotubes, which are useful. A carbon nanotube, basically, what if you take this sheet of carbon here, right, this graphite sheet, what if you took it and then you rolled it up so that end connected with that end? So it's, it's a sheet of graphite that you cause it to come around and bond to itself, right? That's a carbon nanotube. There's single-walled carbon nanotubes where it's a single sheet of graphite that gets rolled up, right? Or there's multi-wall carbon nanotubes where it's many, many of these things all rolled up like concentric, sort of like nesting dolls where they're all... Uh, stacked inside one another. Carbon nanotubes are a big deal. They do use these all over the place. They are interesting because basically depending on how you roll it up, you can make this bond right here match with that bond or you can make it match with that bond, right? So you can basically twist it a little bit and whether or not you twist it makes these things either semiconducting or metallic, right? So you can change their electronic properties pretty dramatically, which is surprising, right? 
So they have interesting electronic properties. Um, they mostly use them not for their electronic properties, though. They use them for their mechanical properties. These things, for their weight, they're extremely rigid, right? Car no surprise there. Carbon's a lightweight thing. It's covalently bonded. When you make a big, long tube of it, it's going to be very rigid. So they'll take these things and they'll add them to other things, right? They'll make a composite. Remember, that's just a mixture of two types of materials. They might take, some, say, something like an epoxy and put in a whole bunch of carbon fiber, uh, carbon nanotubes, and I guess we call them, and you can make a lightweight, rigid, you know, carbon fiber component, right? So pretty interesting. There's even people that have thought, you know, if you look at the strength of these things of a carbon nanotube, its strength to weight ratio makes it the only known material that you could make a space elevator out of. What's a space elevator? Space elevator is something, it's an elevator that connects, it's a cable basically connecting Earth to a geosynchronous uh, satellite that's staying put over the Earth in one spot. So it's got a big counterweight, so it stays there. And if you were to connect that cable with steel or something, then the weight of the steel cable would actually cause the steel cable to rip, right? It would tear it, it's too heavy. Carbon nanotubes theoretically have enough strength for their mass that you could make an elevator. So then you could like put a climber or put, you know, gear and you could load, you could have a, have a climb a cable to get up to space rather than shooting it up in rockets, which would be like a complete, complete, complete game changer. Problem is we can't make carbon nanotubes several miles long. We can barely make them like a millimeter long, right? <laughs> so until we figure out a way to make carbon nanotubes a mile long, this is going to remain a dream for people on the internet to write about. It's not gonna happen until we figure out a way to make these together. Because if you have a bunch of small ones and you put them next to each other, then there's Van der Waals forces between those things, right? Or maybe you kind of cross them. It's not gonna have the strength to weight ratio necessary to build this dream of climbing your way to space. Okay, the fact that there's four or five, I think we showed four or five different uh, forms of carbon. That means that carbon has different polytypes or polymorphs, polymorphs, right? There's different structures for the same composition. Sometimes it's called allotrophy, polymorphism. These are the same things. Polymorphism is technically the word we use when it's two or more elements, whereas allotrophy is for single elements. So I guess the correct term is that carbon has several allotrophs, or carbon exhibits allotrophy, because it's a single element that can exist in different forms, okay? Okay, let's move to crystal structures. Crystal structures is a, it's a whole class in and of itself. You can take course on crystallography. We teach one in the spring, actually, in our department. Um, we're not gonna go into much detail, all I want you guys to know is that there are seven different crystal systems, right? So when you go from, when you're arranging atoms, and remember a, a crystal is something that is periodic, meaning you can repeat it over and over and over. You can fill space with it just via translation. Well, when you translate it, you could translate cubes to fill all space. You could translate hexagons to fill all space. You could translate uh, these sort of distorted sort of cubes with longer and shorter edges, right? And that's what these different crystal systems are. So there's cubic, trigonal, tetragonal, orthorhombic, monoclinic, triclinic, hexagonal. Um, this is something, something like this is one you'd probably want to put on your note sheet, right? I'd expect you to know at least that there are seven different crystal systems. And if you want to, you can figure out the difference. Cube, the angles are all 90 degrees and the sides are all equal length. But say um, tetragonal, a does not equal B. Well, A equals B, but that does not equal C. So like basically two of these sides, you could say A and B are equal length, but they're not equal length to C. But all the angles are still 90 degrees, right? Orthorhombic, A is now no longer equal to B. Those are different lengths, and that's also different than C, but it's still 90 degrees. And then when you start tweaking with the angles, it gets weird. Like they get, they get harder to visualize. But that's the different crystal systems. I'm going to skip that. And get to what we care about, which is, okay, if you do have a crystal system, how do we talk about specific atoms, right? We're engineers. We're going to want to tweak these things. We're going to maybe want to substitute out an atom or introduce some sort of change, right? So if we're going to talk about what we do to an individual atom, we need a way to describe it in this crystal system. So we do that using what's called Miller indices. So let's start by drawing a cubic unit cell. In a cubic unit cell, by convention, this back left corner is usually the origin, right? That's the origin. That's going to be our zero, zero, zero spot, right? Then you have to have X, Y, and Z axes. It doesn't matter which way you put them as long as you follow the right-hand rule, right? Meaning your X, your Y, and your Z have to follow your right-hand rule, okay? But if I chose to put X there where my Y is, fine. That means the vertical one would now be Y and coming out towards you would be Z. So as long as you follow the, the, the right-hand rule, it doesn't matter how you define them. But don't be barbarians. Define them in a normal way for the portiers that will have to grade your work, right? Um, 
So the first thing is, if you want to talk about an atom, at a certain point, we can do so. If, say, the very center of this atom, the sorry, the atom at the very center of this unit cell, we can say that it is located in terms of our x, y, and z coordinates at 1 half, 1 half, 1 half. We're going to use round brackets and commas. 1 half, comma, 1 half, comma, 1 half. That, because it's round brackets and it has commas, that's talking about a point, okay? A point at a specific spot. Just like Cartesian coordinates that you saw in math ages ago, you've seen this before, okay? How do we do directions? All right, directions, we can do those. Let's say you start here and you wanna draw, you wanna talk about that direction that goes from that bottom left point on the front that goes to the middle of that atom. How do we do that direction? All we have to do is take the final point minus the initial point. So what's the, what's the initial point's position? Well, in x it goes out 1, in y it goes 0, and in y it goes, in z it goes 0, right? So if you do final minus initial, let's go ahead and write that out, it's going to be, um, it'll be 1 half minus 1, right? 1 half minus 0, 1 half minus 0, so the overall position is going to be negative one-half, 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 except I don't use commas, and I don't leave it in uh, fractions. You're going to multiply this until it becomes whole numbers. So we can do that just by multiplying this by two. So now it becomes negative one, one, one. We put square brackets around it to indicate that it's a direction. And then one last change, one last thing that you can do, is you can put this negative on top of the number. So we could call that bar one, one, one direction. So a negative you put on top. That's just convention, I didn't make these rules, that's just what we all have agreed on in the community is the right way to talk about these things, okay? Any questions on directions? Again, it's just final minus initial. Another way to do this, if you don't wanna pick the two points, you can just say like, oh look, this, uh, this point, when this line, it goes back by half of a unit cell in X, but it goes forward by half a unit cell in Y, and it goes up forward by a unit cell in Z. So it should be minus one half, positive one half, positive one half, which then you multiply it by two. Uh, question, Josh? So, so would you call that direction like, like vector in the center, in the center here or something? If you wanted to be that, that specific one, because right now that's a generic direction. So if you wanted to say exactly that vector, you could say, yeah, this is the direction starting at a certain point. Um, that's almost not, not ever done that I've seen. But yeah, that would be the correct way to talk about that point as opposed to say, um, uh, say one that goes from here to that middle of that face. Those are the same directions starting at different points. Okay, right? That starts and ends at different points, but it's the same direction. Rosa? I thought the same question. Okay, Brennan? So if we notate uh, positions as fractions of one, which we're assuming is the the unit, why do we not do the same for directions? Uh, good question. Normally you're talking about along a certain direction. You're not talking about direction within a single unit cell. So the phenomenon that we talk about in material science, it's usually like say conductivity or strength along one of these directions. It's not happening just within that one unit cell. I think that's the reason why. You can, and in the homework, I think I have you guys, in the tutorial video, I should, so if you haven't seen the homework this week, I ask you to use that crystal drawing software, and I've put up a tutorial video where I show you how to draw vectors on there. I show you how to, you can change the length of it. Um, so if you wanted to, you could make it longer or shorter. Okay, um, families of equivalent directions. Yeah, Rob? Question, uh, so for this part, for a direction, you don't use any commas? For directions, you do not use commas. Commas are talking about points, like a single spot. The lack of commas paired with square, direct, square brackets means a direction. Now, there's something called families of equivalent planes, or uh, directions, planes and directions. Let's do, let's do directions first. So again, here's our unit cell, right? If it's a cubic unit cell, then I could rotate this thing in any of our three principal directions and get the same structure afterwards, right? So let's draw atoms. Let's just do a simple cubic cell for a minute where there's just atoms at the corners. This is what's called simple cubic. If I want to talk about a direction, I could say I want to know that direction, right? Right there. And you could label that one. You'd say final minus initial. It goes one in the y direction. It doesn't move anywhere in the x and it doesn't move in the y. So that direction is 0, 1, 0. 
However, crystallographically, that direction is identical to, say, like this direction. Because I could have rotated it and gotten the exact same structure, right? I could have rotated that thing and it's the same thing. So really, this direction, that specific direction, belongs to what we call a family of directions. And the family of directions are the 1, 0, 0. Or we could have said the family 0, 1, 0. It's the same thing because it's cubic. Because this structure is cubic, those two would be in the same family of directions. So we use the pointed brackets to talk about a family of directions that are crystallographically identical. Any questions? Okay, let's keep going. When you do directions in all the unit cells, it's pretty easy. It's just like that. Like all these things, you would just pick an origin, you would draw your x, your y, and your z. The only one that really messes things up is hexagonal. In hexagonal, you have to add another axis. Here's what I mean. If you're just looking down on the hexagonal lattice, what they do is they define three different axes, right? They say you've got A1 going the A1 direction, you've got the A2 direction, and you've got the A3 direction. We're gonna ignore C for just a minute, like coming out, coming out of the plane, we're gonna ignore that. We're gonna say that, we just wanna know, how would you identify that line going, starting at the origin right here, and going out this way, right? How would you talk about that? The way they do it is in terms of A1, A2, and A3. So let's write it out. In A1, it goes one step. In A2, it goes one step, right? And uh, oh, I guess I'm doing the green line, sorry. I'm doing the green line. And in A3, it goes minus two steps. So again, that one would be one in the A1 direction, one in the A2, and minus two in the in the uh, in the a three direction, and then zero in the fourth direction, which is out of the board, right? So that's where this one one minus two or two bar comes from. You could have put this negative sign on top of the two, and that's technically the more correct way to do it. Yeah, Colin. So why did it? Why do you not just go like all of them in the negative eight direction? Um. Well, you have to. Whatever you choose has to satisfy these rules. When you convert between regular directions, what we're going to call u prime, v prime, and w prime, when you convert that to the four parameter hexagonal symmetry, it has to follow these rules. So I think it would have been equivalent, but we could double check. Basically, t, let's see, uvtw, in this case, t is equal to negative 2, right? It's equal to negative 2. T needs to be equal to negative u plus v. So that actually might be equivalent, what you said. It might have been the equivalent way to do it. Let's talk about this one, though. Why is that one the way it is? Well, again, on that one, you're going to go, um, you're going to go one in the positive one direction. You're going to go nothing in the, in the a2 direction, but you will go minus one in that three direction. And that gives you this line that way. So again, one, zero, minus one, zero. Okay. I will probably not put one of these on the exam where you have to do hexagonal. I do want to introduce it on the homework. I think you have to work through one or two of these. Takara? So I was going to say there are multiple ways to define the directions, right? There are. There are multiple ways, right? And so we're going to get to that. Like if you did like two steps here and then two steps there, that would be the two, zero, two bar, zero direction, which is the same as the one, zero, one bar, zero direction if you divided it by two. And so they'll usually divide these things by the lowest common denominator to avoid that problem that you just mentioned, okay? Does this kind of make sense? It's not great. I'm not going to put this on the midterm. You will see it on the homework. It's not so bad. Rosa? Um, so when we're going, like, when those two things go are small, are they really because they're making the same lines and cross those two points? Yeah, they're equivalent because they're describing the same direction. They're not describing the same length of that vector. It's just the uh, direction of the vector that it's describing, okay? Any questions I can answer here? Um, again, so if I gave you, say from a cubic, right? If I wanted you to draw the 0, 1, 0 direction, but I wanted you to draw it in a hexagonal lattice, what you would do is you'd say, okay, I know u prime, I know v prime, and I know w prime, so I can solve for u, v, t, and w, which are the hexagonal coordinates, by plugging them into these formulas. It's not the most difficult thing ever. It's just a little bit of busy work. So. I'm not probably going to waste your time on that on a midterm because I think it is just busy work. But I do want you to understand the concept that it's hard to think of hexagonal 
because it has these three directions to choose from, so they introduced a new coordinate system for it. Yeah, Arthur? Why is there four directions? So this is looking straight down on it, so that's our three directions, but you've also got coming out of the board, and that's your fourth one. Okay. So that's a zero? Uh, that would be, in, in these examples, they're, they're going flat along this basal plane, so they're not coming out at all. Therefore, that's why this last number is zero for those. If this direction is coming up as well, you'd have to account for that. Okay? I'm going to skip that. Okay, now let's talk about planes. With planes, first off, we use round brackets, just like we did with points, but we use round brackets without the comma. Without the comma means you're talking about a plane. Right? So a one comma one comma one does not equal a one one one, right? Because this is a point and that is a plane. Right? So that's the notation we use for them. And then we introduce something called the HKL Miller indices. Okay. Where does this come from? Well here, here's the rules. The rule is um, if your plane passes through the origin pick a new origin, right? So for example, if we're trying to draw this structure right here, right? We, or rather, we're trying to identify what that plane is. First thing to do is to pick an origin. So the common one to do is to pick that back corner over there, right? So that's our origin. So the next rule says, okay, we well, first off, we picked an origin and the plane does not run through it, so we're okay, we can proceed to step two. If you chose, if you're drawing this one, and you put a point right there, that plane passes through it, you must move your origin, right? You can move it to any corner spot, anyone you want. I'd probably put it here, right? You, can, you, have to, you have to move it to another corner spot, okay? Rule number two says, identify where the planes intersect the three axes, right? So again, I'm gonna make this bigger so it's easier to see. If we're doing this unit cell, we're trying to figure out how we name that plane along the top of our dice. The first rule is to pick an origin, which we did. Draw your axes, x, that's y, that's z. The second rule was identify where the planes intersect your three axes. Where does it intersect z? It just intersects at one, right? It intersects it at one unit cell up, right? Does it ever intersect X or Y? Never, so we'll write that it intersects them at infinity. Right, so we've got infinity, infinity, and one. Now we move to our next step. Next step says, take the reciprocals of these locations in terms of ABC. So reciprocal, you're gonna flip these, right? One over infinity is just zero. So we're gonna say that's zero, zero, and that's still just one, right? And then multiply by the common factor to get the smallest integers. We're already an integer. Now write these integers with no commas in square, in round brackets, excuse me, and you have your direction. Or uh, you have, not your direction, you have your plane, right? So that plane on the top of the dice would be the zero, zero, 001 plane. Let's do a harder one now. Let's do, let's do like that one right there. So we're gonna draw it. Um, Okay, again, the plane is located at, it's going from down to there, up to there. So it's, it's cutting through the crystal like that. So we cannot choose our, sorry, that's a bad line. We can't choose our origin be right there because the plane goes through it, so we cannot choose that one. So let's choose right here to be our origin. So that's our X, that's our Y, and that is our Z directions. So now it's just like before, we figure out where does it intersect these things. Where does it intersect the x-axis? At negative one. Where does it intersect y? Never. Never. And z? Zero. At positive one. When you take the inverse of those, you end up with bar one, zero, one. We're gonna write that in parentheses, and that's talking about that direction. Okay? Yeah, and? Well, this is the x-direction, so if you go backwards, it would intersect over there, okay? Are there any questions so far? So if I get, oh yeah, Rosa? Why is it, how does it not intersect the Y? Oh. Um, it's running, so like this is the Y axis, it's running like that, parallel to it, so it's never gonna intersect it, or it will add infinity by definition. Okay? Yeah? Sorry, uh, will we have to do that for hexagonal? You could do it for hexagonal. I'm not going to make you do it. Like you can see, they work out examples. It's actually not that bad. I'm not going to make you do that for the midterm. Okay? Yeah, Brennan. 
So um, if the plane, for example, the greatest comes back to the that you start to like two digit numbers, for example. Let's do an example of that. Um, like, do you know two thousand spaces between? Yeah, you put a small space in between it, right? So if I was going to type these things, Brendan's asking a good question. Basically, like, what if you're talking about a plane that's like zero one twenty two? We'll talk about where that comes from in a second. You can put spaces between these, so it's obvious. Um, if you do it without the spaces, they'll think that that's like a um, hexagonal one. So to make sure that that you know that that's not the case, they'll put a space at least there, but probably between all of them. That would be the sort of the right way to do it. Okay. So you could do the inverse. I could show you a plane and ask you to tell me what are the HKL indices for that plane, right? Again, this is HKL that we're talking about, these numbers down here. So let's do it for, say, uh, let's do it for this one right here, right? That plane. So let's draw. You can, you can read it, but let's just double check it. So if we draw the, the unit cell, that plane goes from that corner to that corner up to that corner. Right, so it's that plane. So go ahead and try and name that one. So with the, you're just gonna work these steps exactly backwards. And we lost it. Now the drawing's gonna be gone, which makes me sad. All right, the drawing's gone. Okay, take a stab at that. We'll let you take a couple minutes and work that one through. Let's actually work this one together. Anybody think they know what it is? I think you can actually read it there. But what are you getting? You're getting the negative one one one. So let's see if, if we get the same thing. So let's put our origin right here. Then it's going to intersect, again that's x, y, and z. It's going to intersect x at negative one. It's going to intersect y at one and z at one. So again, by the time you flip that, it's just going to end up with negative 1, 1, 1. Now what if this thing doesn't intersect at nice angles? What if it does something more horrible? And it does, uh, so it's going from here to there. How would you label that plane? Well, you'll follow the same steps as before, right? So pick an origin, whatever origin you want. So we'll just pick this um, Yeah, we can pick that one, right? In that case, it's, low, it's intersecting x at, this would continue out to the 1 half, so it's gonna intersect at 1 half. It's gonna intersect y where at 1 half as well. And does it ever intersect z? No, it's infinity. It's running parallel to z, right? So when you invert that, you've got 2, 2, 0. So you could write that as the 2, 2, 0 plane, or the better way is to divide that by the lowest common denominator, and that's just equal to the 1, 1, 0 plane, okay? All right, there's lots of examples in the book. I've actually done some on the tutorial, so we might move on from this. Anders? Uh, yeah. Uh, will you, if we have something like this, will you give us something like halfway across? Or yeah. Yeah, I'll, like, I'll put next to the point. I'll usually label that that's like one half. Sometimes it'll be like a third or something that would be hard to interpret for sure, so I'll usually tell you what that is to make it easier for us to grade. Yeah. Is there any way to like reverse engineer if you got the coordinates to figure out which plane is it? Or is it just, just Absolutely. Completely? No, you can go backwards, right? Like, say like, like let's let's draw like this three, two, one, right? How would you, how would you go about doing that? So if you don't remember what it looked like, let's do it real quick. Three, two, one. Sorry, if we just like have a number. Say again now? Yeah. So we get the number and then we figure out. Yeah. It's actually three, two, minus one, right? So three, two, and then bar one. How would you do that? So you'd work these steps in reverse. First thing you do is you flip it, and you say it's gonna be one third, and then this is gonna be one half, and then it's going to be negative one. So now you pick an origin, right? Choose an origin, and it's going to intersect your x-axis at one third, it's going to intersect your y at one half, and it's going to intersect your z at minus one, right? So another unit cell down would be down here. So it's gonna be that plane right there, 
Or if we'd chosen the origin to be right up there like they did in their figure, that's one third, that's one half, that's minus one, it would be that. Right? Those are the same plane. Because this is a lattice and it's periodic, it's, right? You can choose any spot. And so really what that's saying is that when we define any plane, what we're really defining is a whole bunch of planes. Does that make sense how these things, and again, that's the same thing that, yeah, the same thing right there, right? So when you talk about a plane, what you're really talking about all the planes through the whole crystal that have that same orientation. And what's going to be important in just a second is the distance between these planes, right? So if you take these two planes and you were to draw them, right? Um, this is the 3, 2, bar 1, and this is the 3, 2, bar 1. This separation between the planes is really, really important. That's, how, that's what tells us extra diffraction. Extra diffraction is the most important tool that you'll learn this whole semester. It's what we use to characterize different phases of matter. Um, we're getting to it later today if we have time. Okay, so we're, we'll come back to that. That separation between those planes, we're going to come back to. Okay, there's something called linear density and planar density. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. Linear density is just the number of atoms centered on a direction vector per length of vector, right? So if your line, if your vector is like one unit cell long, and you have an atom right there, and you have an atom right there, then you could calculate the linear density. It would be, on average, one atom per A, right? One atom per A. Or you could do planar density, right? Planar density is the number of atoms centered on a plane divided by the area of a plane. So let's do FCC for this one. FCC is our face-centered cubic lattice. I'm going to draw the atoms in a different color. So you've got them again at the corners, and you've got them on the faces. And if I choose a, a plane, let's do the 1, 1, 1 plane. So 1, 1, 1 means that we're going to intersect x, y, and z all at 1. So it's that plane. We could draw that, and it would look like a triangle. And it would have a piece of an atom here, has half of an atom on, on these. It's got a piece of atom here, and it's got a piece of atom here, right? Does that make sense how we're in? Because that technically is intersecting these three face atoms. It's cutting them in half, if I'd drawn it correctly. So if, if you wanted to calculate the planar density of that, you could do so. You'd have to figure out what's the area of that triangle. The base length is going to be root 2 times a, right? You could figure out the height, because this length is also root 2 times a. How many atoms are there? Well, there's 3 times 1 half plus 3 times 1 6. So there's actually two atoms there. So you'd take two atoms and divide it by the area of that triangle. We're not going to complete that exercise now. I'll probably work it after class for the sake of time. Does that make sense how you work uh, planar and linear density? Are there questions on this? OK, I'm going to keep going. Um, I think I'll skip some of this close packing for the sake of time. Let's do talk about crystalline versus non-crystalline materials. So crystalline materials have to have long range periodic order. Meaning if you've got a, a lattice, right? Your, let's say it's a cubic arrangement. So all these are unit cells, if I've drawn this accurately, right? Long range means it needs to go for some distance, right? right? It can't just go for like one, in it, right? It's gotta be for some distance. So a crystalline material, even though it has long range periodic order, it can still have regions of different order, right? You can have another grain nearby which is oriented slightly differently, right? We talked about this before. This region right there, we called that a grain boundary. So this is still a crystalline material. It's just what we call a polycrystalline material. It's got many crystals all jammed together, right? So that's polycrystalline. You can also have a single crystal. Single crystal that throughout your entire object, whether it's a you know, pen or a, whatever it is, it's all one orientation. So anybody who's married has a diamond on your finger, that is a single crystal. It's one orientation of the cubic diamond cubic lattice. It's not many small ones because that would diffract light and that would cause light to not interact in the way that we like it to. Plus it wouldn't cut with the nice faceted shapes that we all want out of our diamonds, right? So that's single versus polycrystal. So here's examples of single crystals. If you've watched the documentary on Earth, what is it, Planet Earth? They show you, I think it's called Leche Villa, that cave in New Mexico, where they have ginormous single crystals, which is pretty rare. That's a person. So they can get really big. There's no reason they have to be small. In the real world, though, making single crystals is really challenging because basically what you have to do is you have to make it nucleate in one spot and grow from there 
but you can't let it nucleate, nucleate anywhere else, otherwise you'll end up with a polycrystal material. So that's typically hard to do. Um, we've, we have ways to do it, it's just challenging. So semiconductors in your phones and your iPads and whatever else, that's all single crystal silicon. So it's perfectly arranged <coughs> silicon where all the way through, you know exactly where all the silicon atoms are. Um, you can do that, it's just challenging to grow them that way. And again, we teach it, that's the class we teach in the spring is on how to grow those. Um, okay, so you've got crystal, polycrystalline, you've got anisotropy and isotropy. Anisotropy means that when you're talking about a property in your material, it depends on the direction, right? So let's say I've got a big single crystal. My calculator is a big single crystal, right? Um, if I was measuring the strength of this thing, and it had a different strength this direction versus this direction, then that would be an anisotropic material. If it's isotropic, then it, the, the, the property that you're measuring does not depend on the direction in which you measure it. Meaning, it means it's just like an average in all the directions. It doesn't matter, okay? Many things are anisotropic. Okay, let's now shift gears and talk about diffraction. We're just gonna introduce the concept. We're gonna have to come back to it on Monday. Diffraction, like I said, is, I think it's the most important thing you learn all semester. It is basically how if you work for a company and you wanna reverse engineer what another company's done, your boss will say, go figure out what they used. You'll first start by cutting that thing apart. You'll take the component, you'll put it in the X-ray diffractometer, and it's gonna spit out that steel, or that's aluminum, or that's some weird new LOD that no one knows what it is, right? X-ray diffraction. So it goes way, way, way back. Back in like the 16 to 1800s, people that wanted to study crystals would literally like grab these things and measure angles between the facets. And then they would say, okay, if you've got different planes running through it and there's these angles of difference, maybe it's this type of crystal structure. So this is like a complete useless way to do it. It's very, very terrible, right? So along comes Wilhelm Röntgen, and in 1895 he discovers x-rays, and then x-rays became like all the rave. People would like, they'd hold hands like married people and they'd take x-rays of it, and then people were like getting horribly burned. They didn't realize how dangerous it was, and there's cancer. All these problems came from it. But x-rays are still pretty useful. A few years later, in 1912, Bragg and his son, Bragg and Bragg, discovered that you can use these x-rays to characterize matter. And the way that you do that is by taking advantage of something called diffraction. Diffraction is what? What is diffraction? When light changes direction, that's not a bad way to put it. Light comes in, it undergoes some sort of scattering event, and then it changes direction, right? In physics, you would have seen this before, right? So let's talk about it. It's when a wave encounters a regular spaced object, right? So if you have like a grating, like a chain link fence, that has like regular spacing between like the grating. So if your light comes in and your light has a wavelength that's proportional to whatever the grating is, you're gonna get scattering, right? So you can see this like uh, in the double slit experience, right? So when you put two sources that are producing waves and you put them close to one another, they will have regions where there's strong con constructive interference and they'll have regions where there's strong destructive interference. Right, so in physics, if you saw like the double slit experiment, if you take two light sources, you got two slits, on the wall behind it, you'll see this birefringence pattern where you'll see like strong light, no light, strong light, no light, right? So this is diffraction. Or if you've seen like waves crashing on a lighthouse, it does the same thing. The, the wave comes in at some sort of regular interval, it hits the lighthouse and then it sort of like, it creates waves around it going outwards. If you had two lighthouses, they would then create waves that diffract off of one another, right? They, you, you create destructive and constructive interference. So what do we care about this for? Let's start with constructive interference. If you've got one wavelength of x-rays coming in, and let's say that you've got another one next to it, so both of your, your light is traveling on the same wavelength in the same direction, then that will produce one mega wave, well, one mega amplitude, same wavelength. So the wavelength is unchanged, we just get constructive interference. These things add up, okay? You can do the opposite though. You can start out with one like this, and then you can have the opposite. And if those get added together, you get nothing, right? So you can have constructive or destructive interference, depending on whether your light that's traveling right next to each other, uh, what, what the phase of it is, right? The phase basically tells you if you start right here, you're going upwards, and if you start right here you're going upwards. So they're off, there's a phase shift between those two waves, right? They're off by one half of a wavelength, right? Yeah, Brendan? Does this only happen when they're traveling in the same That's a good question. I should know the answer to. For diffraction, they're all traveling the same direction because we basically use like a laser to start with. We, we produce something where they're all traveling very close to the same direction. I will have to get back to you on whether that works. They're going counter. I, I just don't know. I think that it should still cancel, 
I got to double check. Okay, so what we do is we take advantage of that phenomenon and we do it by taking planes of atoms. And again, this will be the last thing we cover today. So before we showed you, right, in your unit cell, let me just draw like two unit cells here, right? If these are our cubic unit cells, right, let's draw, let's draw some planes of atoms. We could say atoms located on the, what plane would that be? That would be the O10 plane. Well, that's also an O10 plane. That's also an O10 plane. We could keep sketching those just by moving our origin to a different spot. So we're talking about this separation distance between those planes. It's easy to see when you do the, the face of the cubes. That distance becomes hard if you're talking about some weird plane that's like cutting diagonally through it. So that is your D spacing right there, D H K L. So that's this spacing right here, right? Make sense? Now in comes light, in comes this light, and it's gonna be doing its thing, right? Where it's going down right there, this one's gonna be doing the same thing, because when the, when the light is originally introduced, it's coming from basically a laser, so they're all coherent wavelength coming in, and they're all going the same direction. So if we were to draw these things carefully. They all reach that point, and they're all going downhill, right? See that all three of those blue lines are now starting to go down together, but here's the problem. The first one intersects an atom right there, so it's going to diffract and start doing that, right? Meanwhile, this one will travel half of a wavelength, and then it's gonna go up, right? So by doing so, it's gonna now be out of phase. That, you guys see that? Because it traveled what's called a path difference, this distance from there to there, and then from there to there. That's the extra path length that it traveled. By doing so, so basically there are certain D spacings as a function of the incoming angle of this thing, theta, where you're going to get constructive interference and destructive interference. You don't need to know it in better, any better than that. All you need to know is like, the geometry here doesn't matter as much as you understand it. What I want you to understand is that when light comes in, if it, if that extra path length is equal to an integer number of your wavelength, then you're going to get constructive interference. Or another way of saying that is if lambda is equal to two times d times the sine of theta, so basically two because there's two of these path lengths, and then d times sine theta is the distance of that path length. If lambda is equal to that, then you get constructive interference. If it is anything else, you get destructive interference and your light won't come out. Basically your sample, the, your sample will absorb the x-ray light. But if, if your d and your sine theta are chosen in such a way that they that 2d times sine theta is equal to your wavelength of light, light will come in and light will come out. And you can measure that. So ultimately what you're going to get, almost out of time, what you're going to get is you're going to get a pattern that looks like this. As a function of 2 theta, if you were to plot intensity, you're going to have some background, but then you're going to have really sharp peaks with different intensities, right? And from the position of those peaks and the intensity of those peaks, you can tell what any crystalline material is, right? Which is amazing, which is why these guys won a Nobel Prize for it. It's phenomenal. We still use it today. We've gotten really good at it. We have machines that make it really easy to interpret. You don't have to know the geometry of your crystal. It basically has a search and match. Basically, these, uh, these peaks, their locations and their intensities, they're not perfect like a fingerprint, but they are generally rather unique. So as long as you know what those are, it can search through a database and look for things that look like that and spit out a series of candidates that says, this is probably aluminum, this is probably tungsten carbide, this is probably whatever it is, which is pretty awesome and we'll pick up there next time. Enjoy your weekend.